This word was seed of all the thing to be. A hand from some greatness opened her heart's locked doors and showed the work for which her strength was born. As when the mantra sinks in yoga's ear, its message enters, stirring the blind brain and keeps in the dim, ignorant cells its sound. The hearer understands a form of words and musing on the index thought it holds, he strives to read it with the laboring mind, but finds bright hints, not the embodied truth. Then, falling silent in himself to know, he meets the deeper listening of his soul. The word repeats itself in rhythmic strains. Thought, vision, feeling, sense, the body's self are seized unutterably and he endures an ecstasy and an immortal change. He feels a wideness and becomes a power. All knowledge rushes on him like a sea, transmuted by the white spiritual ray, he walks in naked heavens of joy and calm sees the God face and hears transcendent speech. An equal greatness in her life was sown. Accustomed scenes were now an ended play, moving in muse amid familiar powers, touched by new magnitudes and fiery signs, she turned to vastnesses not yet her own. Allured, her heart throbbed to unknown sweetnesses. The secrets of an unseen world were close. The morn went up into a smiling sky. Cast from its sapphire pinnacle of trance, day sank into the burning gold of eve. The moon floated, a luminous waif through heaven and sank below the oblivious edge of dream. Night lit the watchfires of eternity. Then all went back into mind's secret caves, a darkness stooping on the heaven bird's wings sealed in her senses from external sight and opened the stupendous depths of sleep. When the pale dawn slipped through night's shadowy guard, 
Vainly the newborn light desired her face. The palace woke to its own emptiness. The sovereign of its daily joys was far. Her moonbeam feet tinged not the loosened floors. The beauty and divinity were gone. Delight had fled to search the spacious world. Nargis is starting. Would you begin, please, Nargis? This word was seen before the thing to be. A hand from some greatness opened her heart's locked doors and it showed the world for which her strength was born. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this word, these word that, this message that her father gives to her, this is the seed. We plant a seed and everything sprouts from it. No? So all the thing to be, the whole story of Savitri and Satyavan sprouts from this seed as for party plants when he says, uh, go out and find the one who is waiting for you. And it bring, this word brings about a change in Savitri herself. She feels as if a hand from some greatness has opened up the locked doors of her heart, as if her heart was closed and now somebody's unlocked it, it opens and she sees the work for which her strength was born. She understands why she has been born, why she's come on earth. There's a partner waiting for her and together they will do that work. Hmm? Then we have a very long sentence. It's one of the longest sentences in Savitri. And it's uh, very important for us. This sentence is, an, is most of it an image. Hmm? He starts, as when, as when the mantra oh, enters yoga's ear. He's going to describe something, the effect that the mantra has. And then at the very end of the sentence, write down, on line 238, um, he tells us an equal greatness in her life was born. It's as if she has heard a mantra and the full meaning of it has entered her consciousness. So she feels completely changed and transmuted hmm, by this message, this seed. Hmm. So let's read this step by step. Sri Aurobindo is telling us the four stages. What happens when we hear the mantra? You can read the first um, part. Three lines, please, um, Suresh. As when the mantra sings in yoga, its message enters sleep. Stirring. Stirring the blind brain and keeps in the in, in a ignorant cells its sound. Mm. Ignorant. Dim ignorant cells its sound. Ignorant cells its sound. Yes. <coughs> so, um, w of course, nowadays we, we read mantras, but the, trend, the, the traditional way of transmitting a mantra was that the guru would speak it to you in your ear. No? So when the mantra sinks in the ear, what happens first is the sound enters. 
the sound enters the ear and it stirs the brain the brain just hears the sound it doesn't understand the message no? and it keeps in the dim ignorant cells in the brain cells the sound of the mantra gets imprinted that's the first stage so traditionally we are told that when we are learning a mantra the sound is very very important it's the rhythm and the sound of the words and getting that right is the first stage no? second stage Berber Hmm. So this is what we do here. The hearer understands a form of words and we try to understand it. We muse, we concentrate on the thought that uh, uh, is held there in the words. A thought which he says is an index. It's pointing to something. It's pointing to something behind the words or beyond the words no? so we concentrate on the words and we try to uh, grasp the thought that is held there in the words and we strive to understand it he strives to read it with our laboring minds that's what we do no? and what he finds is just bright hints of the meaning there are some indications we get a feeling that oh yes I understand that sentence but we haven't received the embodied truth the truth of which the mantra is the sound body mm -hmm. but it's the second step it's also important all these four steps were important in, in the tradition so third step you like to read yes hmm? then in seven in himself to now he needs the deeper listening of his soul his soul yes soul. so this is the third step then he has to silence his mind he has to silence the laboring mind he has to fall silent in himself and concentrate on that sound which is there in his brain and then he comes into contact with the deeper listening of the soul which is not the listening of the physical ears or the brain and it's not the listening of the mind it's the listening of the soul the soul has to hear the mantra so when the soul hears the mantra what happens will you read yes hmm? the word repeats itself in rhythmic strains thought vision feeling sense the Buddhist self art sees unutterably and it endures and fixes it and an immortal change hmm. so the mantra starts repeating itself in its rhythm its correct rhythm it goes on and on repeating itself and with the repetition of the mantra silently within him then everything gets seized with that vibration thought vision feeling sense the whole body begins to vibrate are uh, seized unutterably and he endures he experiences it may be uh, difficult to bear that experience 
because it is so intense, an ecstasy and an immortal change. There's a, a realization, a complete uh, transformation of some kind. No? And that's what's described in the next step, Mahalingam, or the next uh, lines. He feels the awareness and becomes a power. All knowledge rests on him like a sea. Continue. Transmuted by the white spiritual rays, he walks in naked heavens of God and calm, sees the God face and hears transcendent speech. Yeah. Equal greatness in your life was born. Yes. So then he gets the full effect of the mantra, he feels the wideness, he actually becomes a power. And all knowledge rushes in like a sea breaking through a dam or a dike. He becomes transmuted, changed in form, transformed by that white spiritual ray. And his whole being and nature is changed. He walks in naked heavens of joy and calm. Those heavens are not covered by anything anymore. He can walk in them, experience them intensely. And he can see the face of the divine. And he can hear the speech, the, the voice that comes from the transcendent. So that's an enormous change. This is the real purpose of the mantra. When the Guru gives you the mantra, it's meant to bring about a realization, a complete change in your being. Hmm? So just as if Aswapati had spoken to her a mantra and it had sunk into her brain and first she tried to understand it and then she uh, opened up to the deeper listening of her soul and she finds everything is changed. This is what happens to Savitri. An equal greatness in her life was sown. He takes us back to the image of the seed. No? No. This word was the seed. The seed has been sown in her being and this is the effect that it's had. So then there's an outward effect as well, Varadarajan. No? Custom scenes were now an end at play, moving in news amid familiar powers, touched by new magnitudes and fire sounds. She turned to Vastnasus not yet her own, allured her heart drop to unknown sweetnesses. The secrets of an unseen world were closed. Mm -hmm. Oh, accustomed scenes, all the things that she's used to seeing, now she feels this is the end of all that. There's going to be a big change. But she's still there for the rest of the day. So she's moving amid these familiar powers, all these movements around her. But she's moving in muse, in a kind of dream, as if she's not fully aware of the things around her because she's been touched by new magnitudes. <coughs> Great things have suggested themselves to her and fiery signs, signs or signals that are full of intensity, something has touched her. So in her consciousness she's turned to vastnesses that are not yet her own but that will become her own, she feels. Her heart is allured, it's attracted. It's attracted to unknown sweetnesses. The idea that her life partner is waiting somewhere for her, the sweetness of meeting and being with him, and the secrets 
of an unseen world, all this comes suddenly close to her, it seems close and possible. Hmm? Joel. The moon went up into a smiling sky, cast from its sapphire pinnacle of trance, they sank into the burning gold of Eve. The moon floated, a luminous wave through heaven, and sang below the oblivious edge of dream. Night lit the watchfires of eternity. Hmm. So it was morning, no? It was early morning when uh, Aswapati heard the voice and as, uh, Savitri comes as if an answer to it. So now the morning uh, goes up, the sun rises into this smiling sky, and then it goes down again. The sapphire pinnacle of trance. It's the noonday when the sky is at most blue, the sun is at its highest, the day is at its most intense. Hmm? It is cast down from that <coughs> day, sank down into the burning gold of evening with the setting sun. Hmm? And with the setting sun, uh, she can see the moon. It must be near to the new moon because the moon is floating there, a luminous waif, he says, through heaven. A waif is a lost child. Yeah. So it's a little, a little strip of moon and it doesn't stay in the sky very long. It also sinks down below the oblivious edge of dream. And with the nightfall, we don't see the moon anymore. Uh, oblivious means forgetful. It comes into a kind of dreamy state. And then it's f fully night, and the stars are there. Night lit the watch fires of eternity. This wonderful image for the stars, who are like the guardians with their spears, you know, guarding the whole universe. <clears throat> so in a single sentence, he gives us a beautiful description of the whole day and the coming of the night. Mm -hmm. um, Emily, what do you read? Then all went back into mine's secret caves, a darkness stooping on the heaven bird's wings. Sealed in her senses from external sight, she opened the stupendous depths of sleep. Yes. So all this awareness of the world around goes back into the secret caves of mind and it's as if there's a darkness comes down like a, the wing of a great bird and the senses get sealed in, all the sense impressions. This is what happens when we fall asleep, no? We, we are not aware anymore of the noises and the things that are going on around us. It all gets sealed up and we are in that inner sleep state, the stupendous depths of sleep. Martin. When the pale dawn slipped to a night shadowy dark, vainly the newborn light desired her face. The palace hope to its own emptiness. The sovereign of the daily choice was found. The moon in feet tinged not the lucent rose. The beauty and divinity were gone. Last line, please. Delight had fled <laughs> to search the status of mm. So it's clear, no? When the dawn comes again, the first pale light of dawn, slips through, it's as if the night is guarding everything, it wants to keep everything dark, but the dawn slips through that uh, watchfulness of the night. He says, 
the, the newborn light, the light of the new day, uh, was looking for Savitri's face, but she's not there. Mm -hmm. Vainly, in vain, the newborn light desired her face. And that palace where she lived woke up to its own emptiness. The one, the, the sovereign, the ruler, the one who directed all its daily joys, she was already far away. No? So her, her moonbeam feet, they are no longer tinging, coloring the, the lovely floors, the marble floors. The beauty and divinity were gone. Delight had fled. She'd run away from this place to search the spacious world. She has to find something. And that's the title of the next canto, The Quest. Her Search. So, Rosa. The quest. The world was opened before Saturday. At first, a strange witness of new brilliant scenes. We put her mind and kept her body's gaze. So here she is, she started on her journey and the ways, the roads, the paths of the world open up in front of her. And as often happens when we start a journey, uh, we are occupied with all those new things that we are seeing. Hmm? So at first, this strangeness, this unusualness of these new brilliant scenes that she's never seen before this keeps her mind uh, occupied. This is what is peopling her mind and keeps her eyes uh, fixed on the outer scene. Nergis, would you read the next sentence, please? But as she moved across the dignity of a deeper consciousness welled up in her. A citizen of many seas and lands, each soil and country, it had made its home. It took all fair plan and people for her own, till the whole destiny of mankind was hers. Mm -hmm. So at first she's preoccupied with that outer scene. But as she moved further on her journey, a deeper consciousness welled up in her. It's the image of water coming up out of the ground. Some, this deeper consciousness comes up towards the surface. And that deeper consciousness has lived in many different scenes and climates. It, it has lived, it has made its home in all the different lands and uh, among all the countries and all the nations and peoples. You know? it, it has uh, come many times before to the earth and it's lived in many, many different places. So some feeling of familiarity comes up. Each soil and country it had made its home. And that deeper consciousness took all the clans, all the different families and uh, city-states, the peoples. She felt they were her own family or belonged to her. Until the whole destiny of mankind she's identified with the whole destiny of the whole of humanity. Mm. Suresh. Mm. This unfamiliar space and her way, their own and neighbors to a sense within. Plants 
landscapes recur like close for curtain fields, cities and rivers and plants have risen calm. Claimed, like, claimed. Like slow recurring memories in front. The stars at night uh, uh, pause brilliant friends. The winds murmur to the of ancient things, and she made nameless com comrades, comrades loved by her ones. Mm. So sometimes we have a, an experience like this. We go to a place, we know that we've never been there before in this life, and yet it seems familiar to us. Mm? So these unfamiliar spaces on her way, she felt they were known and neighbors, something close. Uh, this inner sense of hers recognizes them. Whole landscapes, it's as if she's seeing them again. They are recurring, they're happening again, as if they are uh, fields that she has known before but uh, forgotten, lost. No, now she's experiencing them again. Whole, all these things that she sees, cities and rivers and plains, one by one these things claim her vision, but she sees them with some kind of inner sense so that they are like memories coming back before her eyes. And uh, even the stars at night, they are the, the shy, brilliant, shining friends of her past. The winds, different places that we travel to have different atmospheres. Um, and sometimes we feel the wind, the air of a particular place. It's something quite distinctive. And these are reminding her, speaking to her, the sound of the winds, of ancient things, things that happened long, long ago. And she even meets people who she seems to recognize. They're people that she has loved once, long ago in another life, in the past. She doesn't know their names, but she recognizes them like comrades some feeling of familiarity and recognition. Hmm? Ah, Bevel. By bygone. All that she's experiencing seems to be part of old forgotten selves, things from past lives. When she wasn't Savitri, she was something else. But this was her experience. Sometimes it comes vaguely, just a, a vague hint, or sometimes like a flash of sudden hints. Even her actions, she finds herself doing things that seem to remind her of something that she's done in the past. They recall uh, a line of bygone power. Oh, I've done this kind of thing before many times. Mm -hmm. Bygone means uh, it's gone by, it's in the past, it has passed us. Mm -hmm. And this even her motion's purpose. Why is she moving? Why is she traveling? She's traveling to find her life's partner. Even this purpose is not new. It seems to her as if she's traveling towards something that's already happened, that's been prefigured. Something like this 
has happened before this great event. She saw to her inner consciousness, to her witness soul, which is remembering all these things from past lives, she seems to be tracing again a journey that she's made often before in the past. And then Sri Aurobindo speaks about something very interesting, that there are beings in the wheels. Would you read it, Mahalingam? The guidance can dump revolving beings, and the eager body of their skin, the dim mass to the goddess road, who move assigned to man, he knew to be from his birth, receivers of the inner and outer law, atones the agents of his speech, will, and witnesses and executors of his fate. Mm. So, something's guiding the wheels of her uh, chariot. Hmm? The, the dumb revolving wheels. Something is turning the wheels, guiding them where they have to go. And in this speed of the, the wheels revolving, there are godheads, small immortal beings, small divine beings, are riding in the wheels. Hmm? He says they are dim, masked, hooded godheads. So we don't see their faces because they have these uh, shadowy masks and um, they, they are hooded. We can't see them clearly. But these beings are assigned to man immutably from his birth. Each of us has these beings who've been allotted to us to look after us during our life. They have to do that. And what is their job? They are receiving the inner and the outer law. So there's two kinds of law that are governing us. There's the law that's governing our inner being, and there's the law that's governing our outer being, our physical being. And these, these little, these beings, these masked beings, they receive that law, or those two kinds of laws, and they um, make sure that the laws get fulfilled in the course of our life. So they are at the same time, it says at once, it means at the same time. They are the agents of the will of the spirit. They, they make sure that the will of the spirit gets uh, manifested, gets fulfilled. And they are the witnesses of his fate, the path that the soul has um, chosen to take in the physical world. Mm -hmm. They see that, they witness the path that we're following and they are also executors. Executors are people who make sure that something gets done. You know? It is supposed to be done and they make sure that it gets done. So very interesting. Did you know that we all have these beings that are going along with us, making sure that we follow the path that we're supposed to do in life, the path that our spirit and our soul have chosen? here in our course through the physical world. Next time we'll read about them a bit more. But I think that's enough for today. Shall we read this passage also? <coughs> this word was seed of all the thing to be. A hand from some greatness 
opened her heart's locked doors and showed the work for which her strength was born. As when the mantra sinks in yoga's ear, its message enters, stirring the blind brain, and keeps in the dim, ignorant cells its sound. The hearer understands a form of words, and musing on the index thought it holds, he strives to read it with the laboring mind, but finds bright hints, not the embodied truth. Then, falling silent in himself to know, he meets the deeper listening of his soul. The word repeats itself in rhythmic strains. Thought, vision, feeling, sense, the body's self are seized unutterably and he endures an ecstasy and an immortal change. He feels a wideness and becomes a power. All knowledge rushes on him like a sea. Transmuted by the white spiritual ray, he walks in naked heavens of joy and calm, sees the God face and hears transcendent speech. An equal greatness in her life was sown. Accustomed scenes were now an ended play. Moving in muse amid familiar powers, touched by new magnitudes and fiery signs, she turned to vastnesses not yet her own. Allured, her heart throbbed to unknown sweetnesses. The secrets of an unseen world were close. The morn went up into a smiling sky. Cast from its sapphire pinnacle of trance, day sank into the burning gold of eve. The moon floated a luminous waif through heaven and sank below the oblivious edge of dream. Night lit the watchfires of eternity. Then all went back into mind's secret caves, a darkness stooping on the heaven bird's wings, sealed in her senses from external sight, and opened the stupendous depths of sleep. When the pale dawn slipped through night's shadowy guard, vainly the newborn light desired her face. 
the palace woke to its own emptiness. The sovereign of its daily joys was far. Her moonbeam feet tinged not the loosened floors. The beauty and divinity were gone. Delight had fled to search the spacious world. The world ways opened before Savitri. At first a strangeness of new brilliant scenes peopled her mind and kept her body's gaze. But as she moved across the changing earth, a deeper consciousness welled up in her. A citizen of many scenes and climes, each soil and country it had made its home. It took all clans and peoples for her own, till the whole destiny of mankind was hers. These unfamiliar spaces on her way were known and neighbours to a sense within. Landscapes recurred like lost, forgotten fields. Cities and rivers and plains her vision claimed like slow recurring memories in front. The stars at night were her past's brilliant friends. The winds murmured to her of ancient things, and she met nameless comrades loved by her once. All was a part of old forgotten selves. Vaguely, or with a flash of sudden hints, her acts recalled a line of bygone power. Even her motion's purpose was not new. Traveller to a prefigured high event, she seemed to her remembering witness soul to trace again a journey often made. A guidance turned the dumb revolving wheels, and in the eager body of their speed the dim masked hooded godheads rode who move, assigned to man immutably from his birth, receivers of the inner and outer law at once the agents of his spirit's will and witnesses and executors of his fate.